welcome to the Elements of Whiskey, where we normally in Dutch have a discussion about whiskey. But today I'm joined by somebody very special, so we decided to do it uh, in English. We are talking to Rupert. Um, many people in the whiskey industry know him, um, but we know him from James Eady, and that's what we're going to talk about today. We are having a, a nice glass of the James Eady Kregelicky 13 year olds from the space side, but I think that Rupert will uh, be able to tell us way more about it. So uh, please sit back, relax, and enjoy this episode about James Eady. Hello, Rupert. How are you? Yeah, very well, Max. Very well indeed. Yeah. Um, no, pretty hot though. Yeah. Warm. Warm climate right now. <laughs> to, be, to be honest, and, I heard somebody saying like, with the new climate changes, this is only good for aging whiskeys. But <laughs> well, one of the, one of the things we might talk about later is uh, aging whiskey and, and what what would you do if you wanted to experiment? Yeah. Uh, and I think warm, warmer climate mm, that could be interesting. <laughs> We're going to definitely talk about it. But before we talk about whiskey in depth. I'm very curious to hear more about like you because for people at home who who don't know you, uh, could you please introduce yourself? Oh, crikey! Um, uh, yes, yeah, so I my path in whiskey started in 1991. I dabbled in the wine trade for four or five years. My my father um, is a master of wine, so I, okay. I grew up uh, knowing a bit about wine and thought I was heading that way mm -hmm. until very luckily, and I look back now and go, I was very lucky. I, I missed wine and I got to another W, whiskey. Um, and I worked for Ian McLeod Distillers. Um, moved up to Edinburgh, lived in Scotland 17 years and worked for a great um, family owned business, um, uh, Peter Russell and his son. And you know, I worked there uh, seven, uh, 14 years and I learned a lot there, really um, very informative days, you know, small uh, street fighting company, you know, doing things differently, really having to, to fight to get ahead. And then I had seven years with Jim Beam, for what, what's now Suntory or Beam Suntory. Mm -hmm. And I was uh, looking after the international markets, including South America, India, Middle East, Africa, really good emerging markets where Scotch was booming mm -hmm. and, uh, and global duty free, which is um, an extraordinary market. Uh, and then I had three years at Diageo. So I was very lucky to work on Johnny Walker and Guinness. And, and most of that experience was in, in Africa, in sub-Saharan Africa. Okay. So that was, that was my formal history. And then James Eady and, the other, and Whiskey Invest Direct. So, yeah, very different now. There's a, a very clear link to James Eady himself, the person, because you're his great-grandchild? Great-great-grandson, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, my, my history was always pretty poor, um, okay. uh, unlike my colleague Leon's, who's a historian. But, but this has enabled me to really look back and understand, you know, the different, um, uh, you know, my grandfather, my great grandfather, my great great grandfather, and indeed one further back, William Eady, who's an amazing guy. Um, yeah, so it's lovely to have that sort of history and heritage. My mother was obviously an Eady and she married and became a Patrick. But yeah, it's been a really wonderful journey, bringing together what I knew about Scotch whiskey and what I enjoyed about Scotch, mm -hmm. and then melding that, blending that with family history with some people who did some extraordinary things, who were real visionaries, you know, 150 years ago. So, you know, it's just been a lovely, lovely um, sort of excuse to, to continue my interest in whiskey and, and, and now my new interest in, in family history. And can you just for like explain to me, like James Eady as a person, who was he? Uh, well, I've got one of the things, if you could meet somebody and sit next to him at a dinner party, he would be the guy. Um, okay. Extraordinary guy, you know, one of 14 children, born and brought up in, in Blackfoot, which is now today where Tullabardin Distillery is, mm -hmm. just next door to Glen Eagles. Um, but he left, he left there at 14 years old and went down to Burton-on-Trent and worked in his uncle's tea blending business. So this is a well-trodden path. You know, the, the Walkers, the Johnny Walkers, they were uh, tea, tea blending, some of them. Mm -hmm. So he learned tea blending, then he went into malting barley, uh, and then he went into um, beer. So yeah, he, he learned everything firsthand. He started his his, his brewery in Burton in okay. um, 1954. So yeah, great guy. Okay, we we are not sampling it today, sadly enough. But one of the the, the, the most known products from James Eady, the trademark X. We're, we're gonna dive into that a little bit later. But he was the one who trademarked the whiskey itself. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, the UK Trademark Act was 1875. Okay. And um, yeah, Trademark X was, was 
trademarked in 1877. So great foresight. I mean, and people often wonder what the X is, why X? Mm -hmm. Well, it was the address of Cross Street, the, the brewery was on Cross Street. Oh, okay. So, you know, very lucky to have a trademark that's got such history. Okay. We're, we're going to talk about that a little bit more in, uh, in depth, but you had a very rich working history in the whiskey industry, uh, but you decided to found a company called James Eady to basically do what you want yourself or what was the motivation to do it? Uh, so at the time when we did it, it was um, underneath the umbrella of the other company, Whiskey Invest Direct. Mm -hmm. And we thought it'd be just really good to have a sales and marketing arm because you know, we had access to, to, to maturing stocks of whiskey. Mm -hmm. it, it was an obvious no brainer to, to use a family sort of history uh, company and, uh, and and try and build a, a sales and marketing business. So that was, you know, we, we had the umbrella. Um, within a two to three years, it became very clear that the two businesses were very separate and they needed different sort of types of management, a different perspective, a different long-term, a much more long-term view for James Eady than Whiskey Invest Direct. Mm -hmm. So yeah, my partner and I um, decided that, you know, I could buy the James Eady out and, and then run it exactly how I want it rather than having other shareholders and people telling me what to do. So yeah, really fortuitous. So two, I think two, two and a half years ago, it became a completely standalone business. So now we do exactly what we want to do. And um, a lot of that is influenced by the past. I mean, we really are um, guided by the past because w when the past is good, you learn from it. Mm -hmm. um, and we try not to make too many mistakes. Okay. And if we're taking a look at your, uh, your range, of, of, of whiskies from James Eady. You can see like a cask finish series, a small batch series, and a single cask series. Um, That's correct. W what do they, like, what, what is the difference? Because, yeah, a single cask and a cask finish, what, what, what is the difference? Yeah, between? so the, to, when we started out, it was the small batch range. We, we, wanted, to, we wanted to have affordable, you know, single more whiskies that could be in the sort of, in the UK terms, 35 to 50 pounds a bottle okay. um, and, and give really good quality single malts to the specialist whiskey market. Um, and and our, our ethos is all about value, value for money. I mean, my memory is long and, and, you know, 20, 30 years ago, prices were much more affordable, even relatively. Mm -hmm. So that, yeah, that, that was part of our motivation. So small batch enables us to take two or three casks and really find the best ones that are gonna work well together to create, you know, 1,000, 1,100 bottles and give that to our customers. Mm -hmm. Then we looked at some casks that were obviously going to do better just as a single cask. You know, you, maybe you have one standout cask, so let's not um, let's not blend it with another one. Let's just create a, a single cask bottling, obviously far fewer bottles. Mm -hmm. And then over the next six months, a year, early days, we realized, okay, well, that single cask is really good, but couldn't it do with something, a little tweak, a little improvement um, and, and, and guided by the whiskey ledgers we went back to James Eady's whiskey books from 1860 to 1890 and looked at the types of wood that he was using um, and thought right well let's let's recast this first fill or refill bourbon cask and put it into one of the casks that James Eady was using and um, so we allowed ourselves uh, to do that and started to get some great results um, okay. and, and we're learning all the time you know it's you uh, you don't always get it right but um, some cast finishes, whether they're six months or two years, can, can be fantastic. Okay. And this is basically all there is to the range currently? Yeah. It, uh, added to the Trademark X, the, um, the premium blended scotch, that, that's what we do. And uh, we're sticking to our knitting. Um, we, I mean, it's early days still. You know, if you think the business was, uh, I think our first bottling was 2016. It's not that long ago. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we're small. You know, there's... Um, uh, we're, we're a small team and you know, we want to grow, we are growing, but we want to just grow in the right way with integrity, with authenticity. It, it's, um, this is not about trying to change the world, it's about just trying to stick to our guns and our, uh, and our drive to give customers really outstanding whiskies again and again and again and, yep. and never put out something that we don't think is, is really good. Okay, there's one thing left which I found a little bit weird when, when looking on the website. There's a very clear like button on top saying book. And if I click on it, I will find the book of the distilleries of Great Britain and Ireland. Um, who, who wrote this book? 
Oh God, this is um, well. This, this is I mean, that that link wasn't there until yesterday morning. <laughs> uh, so this, the timing of this is perfect. Um, it's been a busy couple of days. The only downside um, now is that people now know that I just do my research one day before. But that's the only <laughs> <laughs> that's the only downside. Well, now. yeah, there's an expression: hoist by your own petard. Um, no, it's <laughs> this is an extremely exciting. Um, adventure for us. Um, so when, when we were exploring the James E.D. history, mm -hmm. you know, nothing was left unturned. And Leon, who I mentioned earlier, Leon Kubler, who is a historian by, um, by uh, education, mm -hmm. he was digging up everything on James E.D. And along the way, in the British Library, he found these um, 124 articles written between 1922 and 1929 mm -hmm. uh, for a Wine and Spirit Gazette, And they described, rather like Barnard did, they described in detail all the distilleries, ma mainly whiskey, but some gin as well, mm -hmm. in Britain and Ireland. And it gave a full account of the distillery, the technical aspects, what was going on, but also a little bit more than Barnard, a bit more about the people, you know, the, the stories behind, um, who, who, you know, what the owners were doing. And, um, and nobody's seen this stuff. I mean, this was, this was hidden away for now 100 years. This is the centenary of the, oh, obviously, 1922. And it is fabulous material. I mean, it's 650 pages. There's 680 images and photographs. Some of the earliest photographs of Scottish whiskey distilleries. Wow. So it's a treasure trove. It's an absolute spot on find. And it's, um, it's going to make a big impact. Okay, I'm, I'm looking way for it. Currently, I couldn't find a way to ship it to the Netherlands, so that's the only downside uh, during my research yesterday. But to be honest, it was very interesting to see, and, and it looked very impressive and very great to see like all the, the old pictures of the distillery. It really, really drove home like the, 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 like the heritage and the history um, of whiskey in general, um, which we're going to talk about a little bit more in depth later. Yeah. What's been nice, one other quick point of that, Max, what's been nice is a few people who have written whiskey books, they've read this and they've gone, oh, okay, so we made some mistakes. You know, some of the stuff we wrote is not correct. Oh, wow, okay. And, and so the, the, it shows the humility of people in the whiskey trade. They go, okay, we were wrong and this has put us right. So mm. there's going to be some updated additions to a few books. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. I'm really looking forward to it. That's a little bit like a small introduction to, to you and, and to James Eady as a, as a whiskey company. Um, You were saying like you wanted to have the, the highest quality of, of, of spirits uh, accessible. Mm. So uh, to be honest, let's let's be the judge of that. There are three different casks in it. Yeah. Uh, refill Hogshead, uh, distilled in 2008, bottled in 2019, with an ABV of 46%. I got all that one, all that correct, right? Yeah, absolutely right. 46. We love 46% because it you know these are non chill filtered, mm -hmm. natural color. And 46 is, I think, the perfect strength for that sort of whiskey. Okay. Um, it, independently, the Trademark X is bottled at 45.6, so um, that's the old 80 proof. So, yeah, we, we tend to like that. If we're going to cast strength, great, but otherwise 46. And this, was a, this Craig Ellicke is a great example of, imagine the three of us, um, Hugh, Baron, uh, Leon, and myself. We're in, we're in the tasting room we got in, in Chiswick. Mm -hmm. um, and Craig Ellicke is exciting for us. It, it's, it's a... You know, it's, there's no secret. It's a very unusual single malt. It's, um, you know, if you look at the, the, the distillery bottlings, you know, they always talk about, you know, pineapple and ashes. And, you know, it's quite a quirky single malt. Yeah. So when we were looking at these casks, um, we, we had quite a few to look at. But these, these three in particular, we thought, oh, great. You know, there's, a, there's definitely a single cask to bottle here. Mm -hmm. We might do a cask finish. Uh, and it didn't occur to us straight away to do a small batch. Um, but it was really just looking at in detail at each cast when we went, these are, these are unusual, you know, they, they, they're all different. Mm -hmm. And, and on their own, we just thought they're great, but you know, a lot of people might think they're too, too unusual. So literally there and then we said, right, let's just mix these three together. Mm -hmm. Um, we, we put a couple of other samples aside and we mix these three and then We, we nosed and tasted at a car strength, still didn't work. It, it just wasn't sitting quite right. And, you know, we, we, we sort of thought, well, it would be of interest to real whiskey nuts who, who appreciate the quirkiness of Regaliki. But, mm -hmm. you know, we wanted a bit more wider appeal. So we then added a tiny bit of water 
and bang, it just suddenly transformed from being this slightly unusual um, blend of three single casts to something really quite outstanding. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you look at how this whiskey is and you, you think about the flavors, mm -hmm. you're not getting the real sort of ups and downs of the Craig Ellicke. You're getting a much more harmonious, um, you know, whiskey. And I keep on referring to it as a blend. It's not a blend. It's, it is three single casts, so it's a single malt. Mm -hmm. But it's it, it's come together and it and it works. Um, and I think I think when people taste this, they're going to go, oh, I've learned a little bit about Craig Ellicke. It's it's different to the to the distillery bottlings, and it's a lovely representation. So yeah, what do you think of it, Max? Do you like it? Yeah, it, it is very funny because it's uh, it. Luckily, this is my first time trying it. Um, I had it once before. the The first time I had it, it was in my opinion more. Uh, more known fruity flavors I was getting, which are known in, in, in whiskey terms. Uh, so more like uh, like, uh, like green apples and more like the, the grape type of things. Um, funnily, like the first thing that popped in mind today, and it might be the weather or just the sun just messing with my head, the first thing that came to mind was like coconut water. Like I know what you mean, yeah. yeah. It's very, very refreshing coconut water uh, f flavor out of it. Yes. And when you were talking about like more condensed, I feel like, yeah, I can understand it compared to like regular Kregelikis, but I still feel like it is very vibrant, something where every time when I smell, it's more like a little puzzle piece falling on, on its place. Yeah. So, so we, we get, um, and I think this is true of, uh, of the tasty notes that we, that we put out. I mean, on, on, the, on the nose, there's a sort of poached pear, you know, it's the... It's a lovely ripe pear flavor. Mm -hmm. But behind that, there's also, it's a sort of toffee stroke, you know, sticky toffee pudding thing. There's something going on in the background. It develops mm -hmm. on the palate into a sort of more chocolate, I think a white chocolate flavor. Mm -hmm. But definitely on the nose, you get it. So you know, it, it's almost like a sort of complex um, layered structured, you know, blended whiskey. Mm -hmm. You've got these different things coming through. Um, I, I think also the pear on the nose, when you taste it, becomes more peach. It comes a, a little bit sweeter. It's a little a bit little... more tropical than a, than a pear, yes. Yeah, ex exactly. Um, and the, um, then I th very often with, a, I think, a very balanced whiskey, you get a sort of the sweetness that comes from a sort of a, a brown demerara type sweetness, not, 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 a, not a sort of granulated, but a, but a deep, rich sweetness, which is good. Um, so that, yeah, it's interesting. Nose and palate are often so different. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, think this is, I think this is a good example. Yeah, definitely. And, but to be honest, what it, and it's, it, it sounds so stupid, but this is where color really changes our perspective. Uh, perspective of like a whiskey it looks very light of color it is very yeah. uh, a very bright color but it still has this very viscous oily mouthfeel to it which yeah. normally you would, would suggest it's like it's a dark intense whiskey but it's it still has this flavor but without the color which i find very, very yeah no, so i think we're still on a journey in in, in the sort of whiskey um market to to persuade people or almost to do the tastings blind Mind. Mm -hmm. You know, just close your eyes and, 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 and sip it and see what your palate tells you, not your eyes. Uh, the same is true of some of our cast finishes that, um, you know, we, we are known for some very, very dark um, cast finish whiskies, you know, some Manic Moors we've done, some Glen Spays. And yeah. when you look at them, you think, oh my God, this is going to be a real mouthful and it's going to be sherried and, you know, sultanas and figs and raisins. And, and then, oh, there we go. There, there we go. Yeah, I got um, the, by coincidence, I got the, the Glen Spey 12-year-old. I got it sitting right beside me. This is uh, almost uh, Coke territory, yes. it's. Uh... Yeah, but, but you know, so you, you could get over, you know, you could be overawed by that color and think mm -hmm. it's going to be, you know, too much. But it's not. It's, you know, it's balanced and it's right. Um, and I would just say that when we do the cast finishes, we look at the samples every three months okay. because we've learned that the finish can can accelerate you know after a month or two you know if it goes on to three four five months you know it's time it's time to stop it otherwise you're losing any distillery character mm -hmm. um, but no come back to Craig Ellicke yeah it's a it's a good point it is a light color re refill barrels um, but wow isn't it lovely um, really cool um, I'm just this is the most interesting part to me um, I want to talk about the process of 
developing a whiskey itself? Like, how does it start? Um, this whiskey, and the funny part is I couldn't find it on the bottle itself, um, but it was like on, or like it's on the, the artwork has a name and it's called The New Star. Um, ah, yes. It's, 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 it's so interesting to me. Um, because I was like, where do you begin? Do you begin with the idea of like, okay, we're gonna make a whiskey called the new star and it all goes from there? <laughs> or is it just... No, it's connecting our past with the present. And I, I mentioned that James Eady had 300 pubs and we have a list of obviously every pub, when he bought it, um, where it was, you know, for a long time. And it just occurred to us to, you know, call some of our bottlings by the old pub names. Okay. Um, and, to, to do sort of limited editions of them. So th that was the inspiration. The, the first batch we did um, spring last year, my, uh, my wife is an artist, she's a wildlife artist, and there were many, you know, animal named pups. Yeah. Um, so Belle did some, uh, some sketches for us and we thought, oh, this could work. Um, so we, we, we launched those. And then this time round, theme, you know, the, the new star, the star, the, the um, uh, the dawn, the, uh, the sunrise, all these sort of things, which were pub names that James Eady owned. And uh, it's, it's just a nice way of reconnecting with our history and, and having some pretty labels. Um, so. Also very important. Um, and I will be, be getting, when we're going back full circle, we'll talk about the artist behind the, the, circle, like the, the, the label. But first is what is going inside of the bottle. Um, wh where do you guys begin? What is... What is the first step for you? Um, well, an awful lot of uh, an awful lot of tasting and nosing. Um, okay. I suppose that's not quite the beginning. Obviously, the the, the, the buying and the sourcing of the whiskies is, is number one. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I'm very lucky that um, you know I know a few people in the whiskey trade. I've um, uh, worked for quite a few companies, and you know, we we have had um, access to buy you know good good stock. Mm -hmm. um, we probably, you know, it's no secret if you look at the James Eady bottlings up until a year ago or a year and a half ago, 70% were probably Diageo distilleries. We've now broadened that out quite a lot and probably got that under 50%. But, you know, they, they, they're a great company and they've been, um, they've, they've, they've been very good to, to us in terms of what we can buy. Not, but not only that, but, you know, when I buy, it, we get samples, we do massive tastings, you know, three of us do it. Um, because we know that anything that gets through our screening is going to be bottled, um, unless it's gone completely wrong, you know, down the line. But, you know, and that's going to go out in a James Eady bottle. So, you know, we, we have to be really selective when we buy. We'll never buy blind. We'll never just take stuff from a broker. So, yeah, very, very, um, very stringent on our, on our policy. And, th and then, as I said, we know in our minds that we've got small batch, single cask and cask finish. So we're beginning to plot. As soon as we do the first nosings and tastings, even a year or two before we think we might bottle, we're already beginning to think, how is this going to work best? Okay. So it's, 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 it's very future-proofing. It's like, okay, what can I do with this cask once I got it in my hands? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, you look after these casks like you do your children. You know, they, they're growing up, they're changing, and, you know, you've got to anticipate where it's going. Yeah, no, you've got to start with good, good ingredients, good, good, good casks, and then be brutal about, you know, okay, well, we're not going to bottle that one, you know, um, leave it aside and um, and just only put out what you know you can stand right behind. And how do you decide exactly what it's going to be? Uh, it's it, well, it's, as I say, really, there's three of us, and um, you know, if two things, one thing and one thing is the other, generally the two win. Uh, but but it doesn't. <laughs> okay. We, okay. We, yeah. We, fair. We've had one example, and and Hugh and Leon will laugh if they hear this. Um, oh gosh, three years ago. I think it was three, maybe four years ago, they said, right, let's do a cast finish on a Kalila. And I'm an absolute Isla fan. I love Kalila. I love our standard small batch, you know, refill bourbon cast Kalila, eight, nine, ten year old. And they said, no, we're going to put a Kalila in a sherry cask. And I, I was just all over it saying no. And they said, well, let us just try. And we're going to use a Paolo Cotado sherry cask. And I didn't, you know, I knew Paolo Cotado, but I was thinking, well, that, no. But I, I did have to just humor them. I mean, these guys are, you know, the new generation. And I said, okay, fine, let's go for it. It'll never work. Anyway, it, it's been one of the best whiskies we've ever done. Okay. And uh, I had to go, fair, 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 fair game, well done. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so, but it's, 
is it because like we we've discussed this in previous episodes like many times and pretty much every producer says this but how much can an individual cask change compared to pretty much the same cask like if we have two sherry casks can they differ so much oh yes yeah 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 we 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 so we're buying our our casks the sherry casks for finishing we're buying them from two different sources at the moment mm-hmm. and um yeah the the two sources are providing very different qualities and even the quality coming from the same supplier yeah they 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 can yeah they can give a totally different um maturation it's um which is why you have to look at those samples every three months you can't just stick it in there and say i'll wait a year and it'll be fine yeah um so yeah really really different and obviously you know it's a very expensive way to to do it because um as we all know a a, a refill bourbon cask is about 30 40 pounds and a a really good sherry cask is over a thousand so mm-hmm. yeah it's it but it but it you know it, if you get it right the results are fantastic okay so you visit a distillery you can sample a few casks perhaps and then you'll take a pick so that's basically the first step yeah okay and you guys have an own warehouse or where are those barrels stored is it at the so, distillery itself yeah so when we when we bought the whiskies it's they stay in the warehouses that um, where we bought them and then we bring them to uh, Glasgow we bring them to okay. our independent bottling company not, not ours but a third party bottler who have got plenty of space for storage okay. uh, they then send the samples down uh, to London and we, we've got a I say it's an office we've got a, a space as part it's, it was part of the Fuller's Brewery on, on the river in okay. uh, Chiswick so uh, we, we feel like we're in the right place it's an old it's a brewery mm-hmm. company um, and and that's where the samples get sent if it's not COVID lockdown. <laughs> so, but now it's all done in Chiswick, and it's so we we have a bar, we have a tasting room, we have lots of samples, and that's where we do it. Mm-hmm. And, and we have to do it together. We sit down and we'll do it for two or three days, and um, you know sometimes we'll have a few um, discussions. But um, yeah, it's it's uh, it, 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 the the trio gets stuck into it, and you know as you know you you, you have to take time because you, you can't do this thing fast. No, you can't. Um, and then it's in this independent warehouse, uh, and there's where you choose to, um, like for example, like blend it together in a small batch or single cask, or finish it even further. Um, is it? This is something which I'm always wondering about. Like, if you have three casks for a small batch, do you sometimes say like, okay, this one particular cask is way too dominant, so we need to tone it down a bit, uh, so we add just a little less no uh, that's a very good point we, we've never done that um, the, the major decision with the small batches uh, and so so far the way it's come out is we like the we, we like refill bourbon casks to keep distillery character okay. but we do like the first fill you know the, the slightly fresher driven um, slightly faster matured whiskey to give it a bit more body and a bit more oomph Okay. So typically, our, our, our small batches are two refills and one first fill, but we're not stuck to that. That's not rigid, but that's more or less what we do. And so you could argue that the the first fill is adding a sort of you know the, the, the more meaty side to the to, to the small batch. But you know the Kalila, as I was mentioning, other than the cast finished one, <laughs> those are all refill casks. I don't want any okay. first fill. Uh, Kalila in the small batch. So yeah, it's a, it is. It's 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 tweaking. It's looking at what works together best. Okay. I was no. It, it was funny because I like I always found it's very interesting to say like okay, people are blending things together, but then I'm like okay, but does it happen to have like spare? Like <laughs> yeah, it, it would be quite. I mean, you could do it. You you could add in half a cast, but then you've got to decide what to do with the other half. And you know, the being a small independent bottler it the the costs of doing what we do you know compared to a a run of you know, ten thousand cases of apple hour or you know yeah. it, it, it's really high so you've got to be very efficient you, you've mm-hmm. got to be really canny and efficient but minimize your bottling losses mi- minimize the um any potential um losses during during the bottling stage so yeah but you've got to be canny and when you guys bottle it i see like the the, the cask finish series it's in a in a tube and some yeah. of them don't and and like the the trademark x is in a box like how do you decide like on packaging like how you 
want to present the whiskey? Yeah, we, we at the outset, we've always, as I said, I go full loop, we wanted to be good value for money and, and fair value and, and have that sort of almost entry level single malt, sort of 35 pounds, let's say 40 euros and upwards. Mm -hmm. And if you add in a, 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 car, a, a carton or a tube that you're doing very limited numbers of, it does add quite a lot as a percentage to that to, to that bottle mm -hmm. um, and, and we realized a lot you know talk, talking to our customers our, our retailers you know we, we got a consensus that for the small batch you know just show us the bottle give us the detail and our customers will, will buy it like that you know most of those are for drinking they're for people who are you know um, buying it for themselves or for a friend whereas the higher up you go on the scale the more the presentation and the packaging is part of the overall offering mm -hmm. and it would we'd feel it was wrong at sort of 60 70 80 90 euros not to have something that you can give it either as a gift or keep it at home and make it you know it, it looks nice i mean it, it, my deep deep down inside me i'd, I'd love no no outer packaging I, i'd really like to do it all without okay uh, I, i haven't been brave enough to do that yet okay so it's but why wouldn't you why would you want to do it that way but because i think it's much more environmentally friendly mm -hmm. it's much more simple and much more value than is going into the product itself into the liquid um but we do know that an awful lot of the, the upper end is, is gift purchases and i mentioned duty free earlier mm -hmm. i mean that's a massive market where if you haven't got a nice package a nice presentation won't you won't sell very much yeah. okay and um are you guys also like if if it's bottled Uh, do you also like host uh, tasting events or stuff like that, or is it just basically just shipping it out to to customers? And it, it, at that stage, um, I guess we bottle twice a year. Okay. Uh, the, the, the the pipeline, the, the timetable is pretty tight. Okay. Um, we, we as soon as we've agreed what to bottle, obviously the labels are uh, ordered and printed, and then the the bottling dates sometimes slip a little bit. So by the time we've got it in bottle, we want to get it to our customers ASAP. Um, so we obviously uh, we, we sample them again for the tasting notes once it's in okay. bottle, um, which is really crucial because if you do that from samples, it's very often slightly different. Okay. Um, so we, we do do that, but um, no, we, we get it out onto the market um, pretty pretty promptly. Just we, we now basically talked about the basics of bottling, uh, like whiskey whiskey as a small company, um, but I just want to have a, like more discussion broadly with you about. Uh, freedom and creativity uh, as a uh, blender or independent butler because that's basically the first question that I want to ask you like where's the difference between like for example say uh, a blender or an independent butler or well at the end of the day the it, we, we're, we're all connected by wanting to produce you know great quality liquid mm -hmm. I think the way I look at our business the the independent bottling the bottling of single malts single grains is um it's fascinating it's it's difficult to get it right all the time and be really consistent mm -hmm. but blending you know for example trademark x the blending of that 14 different whiskies trying to get the right um percentages of malts and grains trying to get the right ages the right cast finishes the right you know refill first fill sherry mm -hmm. uh cast into that it, that now that's really skillful and real a real art mm -hmm. And this is where I introduced the name of Norman Matheson, okay. who um, I recruited to, to be our master blender, because I knew that we couldn't, um, n none of us could come close. What is it to make, what makes a very good master blender, in your opinion? I think just years of experience. You know, you, you, you can look at master blenders in Scotland. Most of them are diligent, very hardworking, very quiet, you know, stu almost studious, bookish types. Okay. There are the flamboyant ones, and we won't mention any names. Um, <laughs> but they—they've they, learned their craft. They've—it's they, you know—it's recipe repetition over and over and over again. You know, I—I I did a lot of nosing and tasting when I was at Ian McLeod because we did a lot of own label um, Scotch whiskey brands um, and blends, and we were forever sampling. And and it, it just you you learn, you absorb, you. It's by sort of osmosis that you begin to work out what's what's good and what's bad and what works and what doesn't work. So the master blend is that, you know, they, you know, like 80% of us, we've all got the ability to, to be a master blender, I think. Mm -hmm. But have we got the aptitude and have we got the determination and the, um, you know, the foresight just to stick to that and, and do it? Probably not. We, a lot of us get bored too quickly. <laughs> so, you know, they, 
they're, they're wonderful. And, and, and Norman, I think, is a great example. He started blending when he was 16 years old. Oh. Um, and he's well into his 70s now. So um, he's still pretty good. All right. Do you feel, as an independent butler, because it, I feel like you, you more identify as the independent butler type than the blending? Yeah, that's, uh, yeah. I've never really thought about it. It's, it's it all comes together. I'm, I'm probably yeah. I'm proud of our business. I'm proud of what we've done. I'm extremely proud of the way our single malts have been developed, particularly by Hugh and Leon. But I'm deeply proud of the blended Scotch whisky that we do and the history of that blend, and the the reviews and the ra and the rates that it the ratings that it gets. It's it's an extraordinary whisky. So. No, you, if you split me down the middle, it's 50-50. Okay, okay. I'm now talking to the independent butler side. Like, do you feel the, the freedom to experiment um, with whiskey in general way more than a distillery could or would? Oh, um, I, I think inevitably you are more free, yes, because you can... They, you, you know, when you're, when you're at business school or you're in a big company like a Diageo, you're always told to, to, to don't be frightened of failure. And, and if you're going to fail, fail quickly and, and learn from it. Okay. They never actually mean that. They don't want you to fail at all. And <laughs> you're, you're very conditioned to succeed all the time. So I think in a small company, you can do what they tell you to do. In other words, have a go. You know, don't be worried about right. failure. And, and if it doesn't work, yeah. you know, move, move on. So it's difference. You, 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 can, um, you can experiment more because you haven't got the shackles around you. You haven't got your, your monthly and your quarterly targets to hit. Um, You, you you can yeah you can, you can learn more more quickly and is that only on like the business side of things but also on like the the, the whiskey blending or using different types of wood grains yeast uh, whatever uh, yeah well I think I, you 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 can do that obviously we're not we're not distilling so we're not we're not mm -hmm. affecting the the actual distillation so we're we're really starting from the point of the, of the maturation mm -hmm. and you know so the types of cask um, uh, uh, from that point on. So, yeah, we're probably uh, not as experimental as, as some of the distillers are being, and I think there's some great work going on. But, yeah, that, that doesn't mean that we don't still have quite a lot of independence and quite a lot of fun to, to uh, influence the end result, which is what goes into the bottle. And with this, this influence you guys have, do you also feel like whiskey is a way to, to creatively express yourself? I remember somebody talking about how, how do you create a culture in a business, and mm -hmm. I would I would make a, um, a a similar comment about how do you create a, a, an identity for a whiskey, or you know, it, it takes a long time. Nothing is done quickly. So the best thing that we can do as a business and to create our own identity is just to to stick to what our sort of almost our values and our mission statement is. Um, we don't have that written down anywhere, but, but we just instinctively know what it is. Um, and that we hope that speaks for itself in our bottles on the shelf, which is to be authentic, to have integrity, and, and to always provide really good, interesting Scotch whiskey that you know, we, we'll, we'll stand behind every time. And that, that does, over 10, 10, 15 years, that creates a, a, an identity for yourself. What I'm wondering, and this might be very... Uh, a very difficult and, and maybe harsh question, but when we, we we often talk about like the story of whiskies and and the story about distillers and and distilleries and all the history and heritage and all of that, do do you still see whiskey as this this whole category of, of of all these factors combined, or do you still think that it's at the end of the day it's still just a product that can be produced, can be refined and then sold? Um, what way do you lean more? It's, it's sort of very, my, my response is very personal. For, for me, you know, I've sold, sold lots of different um, categories of product in, in my career. But Scotch whiskey is always the one I come back to in terms of the story behind the, the spirit. And not just behind the brand, but as soon as you mention Scotch whiskey, it's, it, you know, you think of the place, you think of the location, you think of an event that happened in your life. Uh, it might have been, a, if you're lucky, a visit to a distillery or um, you know, a, a tasting event in a particular place. And it's a real, um, it's, it, it drums up an emotion and a, 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 pretty often a geographic location and a mood. Mm -hmm. And no other spirit that I know has done that. I mean, vodka doesn't, gin doesn't. Mm -hmm. uh, rum probably could do, um, okay. and, but I, I'm not a big enough rum connoisseur. Mm -hmm. Um, so Scotch has got automatically a big head start. Mm -hmm. We mustn't take that for granted, and won't betide anybody who does, because 
you know, 10, 20 years down the line, you know, you, you might find that Irish whiskey is uh, doing a lot better. Uh, I'm a big fan of Irish whiskey, by the way. Um, so I think, um, yes, the, 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 just the category Scotch is, is already at a, a strong point. Mm -hmm. I think that the real work for us in the Scotch whiskey industry right now is to, to keep talking about the, the art of blending, the art of, you know, if you're doing a small batch or a, so how, how that works, how you pick the right cast to go into that uh, the, the batch if you're a talisker or something else. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's, um, the individual stories are really important. The, the background, the Scotch whiskey category, is it helps us helps us all but it but nobody must take it for granted and we've got to keep driving that um that image and that story to the to the wider market and do you feel like currently there are enough companies who are preaching this message yes um there was a hesitation there um, <laughs> yeah i'm not gonna mention it no <laughs> um, i think there could be more um okay. and i think uh yeah i think medium and large companies could do more they could do better they could um they could maybe be a little bit more honest and a bit more transparent about what they're doing. Because, mm -hmm. um, you know, what I've learned in both my whiskey businesses is transparency it always pays off. Honesty and transparency is the key. Because consumers and um, customers are always, they'll always find out. They'll, they'll always dig, dig into the, um, what you're doing and, and go around the bank. And they, they, they will find out what's going on. Okay. And I just think you, you, you must never underestimate um, the knowledge of your customers. Okay, and if you, just leaving this, this topic uh, aside, because I don't want to get you all in trouble with any uh, uh, distillery or uh, any company at all, uh, but I'm just wondering, if we take a look at the laws currently in Scotland compared to the EU or in uh, uh, other places, America or Japan, do you think that these laws make it more difficult and more narrowing down the possibilities that you guys have? For example, like t different types of wood or anything like that mm, no i, I um, you might call me a bit old-fashioned and traditional here I, I think there's plenty of scope okay. in the current laws um they're broad enough and generous enough for people to do amazing things in scotch and yeah no i i, I you know you you have to have some boundaries and you have to have some rules and i think the scotch whiskey association does a really good job so no i i still think within the Within the current boundaries, there's so much more that we can all do, mm -hmm. and we can make whiskey even better, and we can we can give better value for money to, to customers if we really keep on pushing that uh, pushing the envelope. So no, I don't feel at all restricted by by the current um, laws and uh, regulations uh, from the Scotch whiskey okay. business. And if you is there any experiment or something uh, something small which you would love to try if you could? Or do you say like, no, nah, it's I'm still focusing on everything in in. Well, the we're, we're we're at such an early stage, really, of our development. Um, no, I don't. I'm not a. Um, I think if you ask the same question to Leon, I'm sure he will have some a much better answer. <laughs> I think I'm sticking to the knitting at this stage in the, in the career. More 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 interesting finishes. I mean, just the if you think about the sort of the mass. It, it, let's say we bottle 30 different single malts from different distilleries, mm -hmm. and you've got maybe what well, we limit ourselves, but let's say 10 different wood types to use. The combinations are massive, and, we, and we've only started along that route. I mean, I mentioned the Kalila and Paolo Catalo. Well, maybe we should do something else. Maybe we should do something else with the Kalila. Maybe the Glen Spays would. So there's lots of different um, combinations that we need to try out. Mm -hmm. And if we take the, com the combinations of taking uh, the Kalila and Glen Spay together, then it's even more uh <laughs> more vastly available uh, the options yeah well you know i was in france last week and i remember uh, an old friend michel couvreur who um i remember going to his cellar in burgundy and he was mixing a Macallan and a glenn farkless okay uh, uh, and we all told him he was completely mad <laughs> but i don't think he was i think he was just ahead of the game <laughs> very cool um and 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 i want to bring it back to the to, to this Krigeliki. um the, the label itself like is this this is one way of creatively expressing yourself um you mentioned your wife like sketching up uh, like wildlife paintings um is this like do you have some more ideas or, like things that you want to do with labels or packaging or other fun um, stuff it, it's definitely um and it's really important that the, our major focus is on the on the liquid and, the, and, and what goes into it and the fun we have with them um, with the spirit but the, but the packaging is important these these um 
these labels have gone down very well. Mm -hmm. um, what we might do next year, I, I'm, I can't tell you. We have some ideas. Okay. Uh, we were very lucky to find Christina, um, who, who did this. She's Italian, who did these labels. She had worked for one of our uh, designers, one of our um, uh, packaging designers. And James said to me, oh, you might be worth trying Christina, you know, when you're pitching for the, mm -hmm. the new labels. And uh, she, she, we put it out to tender and she came up with some really, I think, really, really interesting um, labels, you know. Quite um, quite a departure from the sort of standard James Eady, but it just feels like it works. And I think because it comes together through the distillery, sorry, the um, the pub names, mm -hmm. it 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 will never get too far from the from the truth, if you like, of of, uh, of the business and the integrity. So, I think she did a great job. Um, and the, the next lot that are, that are coming out, uh, well, just right now, are, are, are very good too. Um, so, but next year we will have somebody else, and we'll go to a different artist and create something even more different so let's see what that is all right really cool looking looking forward to what what the future holds uh, and that is basically like a small segue to to my final question and you mentioned your more traditional uh like point of view on on, on some things but if we take a look at um future ways of telling stories whatever you can imagine like we, we we've seen whiskey brands using uh, augmented reality and and applic like apps for your phone and stuff like that do you feel like this distracts from a whiskey or do you feel like this is a very interesting way to express yourself and and tell your story i think the the the, the more we can narrow the the gap between the consumer and the and the production, mm -hmm. and, and and make that communication that the, the knowledge and the and the, um, the the communication about the truth of what they're drinking. Mm -hmm. If we can shorten that journey, make it really swift and, and efficient, then then we've done a good job. Okay. So if they can stand at a, at a shelf mm -hmm. and scan something mm -hmm. and and see a little video of the maybe the master blender or somebody sort of saying this is the product, this, I think that's fantastic because. People are, are really hungry for, for knowledge and for the transparency and the integrity that I was talking about. Mm -hmm. and, and they don't want to read a, a, a stupid blurb on the back label that, that is written by a copywriter who's been paid a lot of money in you know, Paris or London. You know, and it's just, it's just bullshit. You know? <laughs> so I, I want to give people the, the honesty behind the product um, as much as possible. So anything that can help that, I'm all for. Uh, talking about future, what is something which the future of James Eady as a company holds? Like what, is there something you can, can share with us focusing on like <laughs> storytelling or creativity? There's nothing really uh, extraordinary that we're sort of working on. O other than, you know, what we've done recently with the book, which, you know, digs deep into the history again and shows that we, you know, the history is important to us. Mm -hmm. um, there's a few sort of product ideas that we want to do. We, we, we'd love to have a couple of ongoing Uh, brands as well as Trademark X, which is always available um, in single malt. It would be great to have something that is a James E.D. Let's have space side single malt or a James E.D. Highland uh, single malt, which which is there all the time. Because okay. everything else is is a one off. It's a non repeatable yeah. product. Mm -hmm. And that's great. But, you know, as we begin to build our reputation, people just might want to have something that they can always go to as well as the Trademark X that's um, You know that's consistent and always delivers. So we, we might we might uh, go that route, and if we do, you could be pretty sure it'll be inspired by the past. Very interesting. I'm looking forward to it. If people want to keep in touch and 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 follow all these developments, uh, how can they uh, follow this future path? Yeah, no, this is where we're rather weak. Um, we do have an Instagram site, but we're not very active on it because it uh, takes a lot of time and uh, an effort. But we do put up stuff, particularly when we do our spring and autumn bottlings. Okay. Uh, we have a, uh, a, a, a Facebook site, but again, not very active. Best thing is, because we're small, just get in touch with us. <laughs> Drop us an email. You know, at the very least, it, info at jamesed.co.uk. It will be seen and we will get back to you. So, yeah, di direct approach. That's, uh, that's the best way to do it. Okay, very cool. Thank you so much, Rupert. It was a pleasure. Uh, you said in the beginning of the uh, like episode that uh, James Eady would be your perfect dinner guest, but uh, for my uh, afternoon uh, glass of whiskey, uh, you were my perfect guest. Thank you so much for your time. Um, and I hope that people at home also liked it. Once again, if you want to get in touch, uh, info at jamesed.co.uk. Uh, if you want to get in touch with us, um, yeah, our Instagram could be a little bit more lively last last few weeks, but you can contact us at Elements of Whiskey on Facebook and Instagram as well. 
Um, Rupert, thank you so much for your time. We're going to have a, a small little sip and uh, hopefully we'll see you soon with uh, a new bottle, a new label and a very new uh, amazing story to tell. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you.